We read from the Word of God as it's found in the familiar words of Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even every one that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake... I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane for money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. 
but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and have given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. We stop in our reading at that point. May God bless the reading of his holy word. In verse 25, in answer to what he just said about how they are conducting themselves towards him, God says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. This is the truth that is summarized for us in that article of our faith that we find in the last question and answer of Lord's Day 21. What believest thou concerning the forgiveness of sins? that God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, neither my corrupt nature, against which I have to struggle all my life long, but will graciously impute to me the righteousness of Christ, that I may never be condemned before the tribunal of God. doesn't make any difference how old your mind and memory is. This is an answer that we ought to memorize. And say it over and over and over. Lord's Day 23 is a little longer, teaches basically the same thing, but this says everything. This truth that God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, neither my corrupt nature, a nature against which I have to struggle all my life long, but here it is, will graciously impute to me the righteousness of Christ. Graciously impute to me the righteousness of Christ so that I may never be condemned before the tribunal of God. The Apostles' Creed takes the whole of Jesus' life and summarizes it with the words, he suffered. Here, the Apostles' Creed takes the whole of the life of a Christian and summarizes it forgiven. Doesn't talk about all the different things that we have to do, it just describes us this way, forgiven. Is that the way I know myself? And if I know myself that way, then that's the way that I'm going to know everyone else. Forgiven. then I'll understand the significance of the first promise of forgiveness. I won't think about that sin. I 
I'm not going to dwell on it, roll it around. I'm going to do everything that I can whenever the memory of it comes back to get rid of that memory, to get rid of that thought, to think about something else. The first promise of forgiveness, I will not think about it. Because for mine own sake, I will remember your sins no more. No wonder we can get up and go again. I remember your sins no more. We don't want to get up. We don't want to go again because we're we drag along all that which God says, I remember no more. About ourselves and others. May the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, help us to understand this truth better and better. That which is forgiven is sin. Sin is doing that which God forbids. And not doing what he commands. Sin is doing what he forbids. But it's likely that there are more sins that we commit by omission because we don't do what he commands. Now, the ones that we think about most often are the ones that we commit. But there are far more sins that are ours that we omit to do. We don't do what he commands. And then... Not only what he commands, but we don't do it how he commands. And that's brought out when Jesus summarizes the commandments, all of them, and says this is what the summary of all the commands is. It's not so much what, yes, it's what, but it's mostly how. Love me and love your neighbor. common to both, doing what he forbids, not doing what he commands, is the word he. Sin is committed against God. Sin is a breaking, a violation of his rules for conduct, for right and wrong. So sin is not just a mistake. And sin is not just a sickness that I have because I'm genetically disposed towards certain sins. And and sin is not something that I can't help it. Sin is a violent violation. This is the way God looks at it. A violent violation of His will, of Him, of His person. Our doing that which he forbids or not doing what he commands, those sins arise, or one, arise out of our corrupt nature. Here it's interesting. Again, we focus on what we do wrong, and that's often what we remember, far more than the things we don't do. But our fathers and the scriptures speak as frequently and as powerfully about the sin that is ours because it is our sinfulness. It's we focus on what we do. God says 
just as bad is who you are. And that's what's referred to and takes up more space in this answer. That God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, neither the corrupt nature against which I have to struggle all my life long, my sins and my corrupt nature. In the answer of the concerning the fifth petition, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, it's put this way. Be pleased for the sake of Christ's blood not to impute to us poor sinners our transgressions, nor that depravity which always cleaves to us. That depravity which always cleaves to us. So it's a corrupt nature against which I have to struggle all my life long, and it's a depravity that just sticks to me. If it was only something that was like, like gorilla glue that just sticks on the outside, it would be one thing. The nature of my depravity is that it's filth inside. So what I see on the surface is just something that's oozing out constantly from within. We call it in Ephesians 4, my old man, that I must be putting off. Lord's Day 33, mortify your old man. In Romans chapter 7, this is that law that we find in our nature, in our flesh, so that the good we would, we do not. The evil that we, that we do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Here's another expression. From the body of this death. That's the depravity. So when we talk about sin and we start looking at what sins are that we're going to be talk about being forgiven, then we start, about, we start out with the things we do wrong. Then we have to think about all the things that we should do that we don't do. And then add all the nature, this corrupt nature, this depravity. In verse 27 of Isaiah 43, he tells us something else that we need to have forgiven. He implies it. We highlighted verse 25. In verse 27 it says, Thy first father hath sinned. Thy first father. And in order to understand that it's not just sins of commission and sins of omission and depravity, then the, the, the identification of our sin is also this, that we need to be forgiven of. Let me describe it this way. All of you who have had miscarriages know the reality that there is an infant, a life, a child, a person who died, and according to Romans 6.23 and Romans 5.12, died only because it was a sinner before it did good or evil. It was a sinner. Otherwise it wouldn't have died. Now, where did that child's sin come from? Well, Romans 5.12 tells us that it came from our first father. And there's then, then, then there's this reality. There is what's called original sin. That belongs to every human who has Adam as his first father and as his representative head. 
So now, sins of commission, sins of omission, depravity, original sin. Then there's corporate sin. When you believe and profess faith in, I believe the forgiveness of sins, then, then let's begin to realize how great that forgiveness has to be because the pile of the sin easily fills the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Indian and the Arctic Oceans. And then the whole of the firmament. One more thing about sin. A correct understanding, true knowledge of God, it's sometimes called. True knowledge of God gives a correct understanding about sin that says... Every one of them, each one of them, correct understanding of God, true knowledge of God, deserves from him against whom it's committed to be punished. Every sin must be punished. Hebrews speaks of God as a consuming fire who, because he is God and it's committed against him, must give a response. And his response to every sin is to punish it. He can't wink at sin. He can't let something that's committed against his holiness go. He can't just set it aside. He, gotta, he has to. To be God, he has to respond. And that response is shown in his just anger, just wrath that has to punish every sin. Correct understanding of sin as earning that kind of just punishment is what brings us into the correct avenue of godly sorrow over against worldly sorrow. Every human, and, and we just as everybody else, we understand worldly sorrow. Embarrassment. Shame. It's as if we've been exposed, and so right away we want to cover up, find ourselves a hole that we can dive into. Real. But God gives us that, not so we stop at that point, but that we go to the next step, and that is Correct understanding of sin is not just that it's embarrassing to me and I'm, I'm ashamed, but it's realizing I deserve hell. I deserve that lake of fire. I deserve to be where the fire's never quenched and no single nerve of my, my body, my resurrected body to damnation is ever damaged so that that nerve is ever destroyed, but it's always feeling tremendous sensitivity to the fire of the wrath of God against what I am and what I have done. No wonder where the te teeth are clenched and grind, and the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. That's the awareness. So that, yes, embarrassing, but look at what I deserve. That's the correct knowledge of sin. Now, if we see 
and, and the better we see the pile, and the better we see what that pile deserves, the better we're going to understand that God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Jesus Christ. And he remembers my sin no more. What that means, forgiveness, is that I am set free from the personal responsibility of bearing the punishment that's rightly mine. Personally set free. And I am personally set free because the punishment that I deserve has been endured. He's endured it. And there's nothing left. So this eternal lake of fire that belongs to me rightly is born, endured, the whole of it. Remember when Moses had to hide in the cleft of the rock and God walked past and Moses saw the glory of God. A part of the glory of God as expressed in Exodus 34 verse 7 is this. That God will not pass over transgressions. Let's find that. Exodus 34. It says that he forgives, but at the same time, he declares this. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Here it is. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Part of God's glory is he will not clear the guilty. The guilt has to be paid. And forgiveness is, he provided the forgiveness. He earned the satisfaction. He bore the punishment completely. Remember, this, this is a profound example that has stick in, stuck in the minds of many when Brian, Reverend Heisinger talked about the diamond that is cast off the ship and it sinks down and it goes. But you know what? Every single one of us knows that that diamond's still down there. That sin that goes all the way to the bottom and is remembered no more, it's still there. Forgiveness means it's gone. It's completely gone. It can't be found. Not even with the perfect eyes of God. Not because God is a short memory, but because God wants us to realize that He will not deal with us as one who remembers. You know, this is God communicating to us in a way we understand. This is human nature. I forgive you. You ask to be, I forgive you. I'll forgive you again. Wait a minute. You're asking for forgiveness for the tenth time. See, I rem all nine others, I got them. This is ten. And all of a sudden, all those I forgave, I've resurrected and I've brought right in front. Here they are. You expect me to forgive you again? It 
So God comes to us in language we understand. I don't remember them. It's gone. I have no markers. I have nothing. So when you and I sin today, God will never say to us, you know how many times it's been now? Never. Gone. Forgiven. For the sake of Christ's satisfaction. Now, a part of that Righteous, that forgiveness, which is not so much remembered here, but it, it, is, it is brought out in this question and answer. It's this. Lord's Day 23. We're not that far from it, so we're going to get there pretty soon. Here is that God graciously imputes to me the righteousness of Christ. He not only says the satisfaction has been earned so that all of the sins are, don't ever have to be punished again, but he also says, and I impute to you the righteousness, all the perfect deeds of Christ I put on your account. Here's the language of 23. It's as if I had fully accomplished all that obedience that God requires. It's not just that I didn't do anything wrong. God looks at us as if I did everything right. That's forgiveness. Now, now think of how we do it. Well, I won't remember. And every time I remember, I'm going to try to distract myself and not think about what you did. I'm going to think about something else. Okay, now here's the other way. I am going to think about the fact that God has made me righteous so that it's as if I did everything right. That's how God looks at me. I'm going to look at you as if you didn't, not only didn't do the wrong, you did it right. You did it right. It's not just that you, I'm going to forgive you for hurting me. I'm going to see you as if you loved me. That's the way he does me. That's forgiveness. I believe. See, you, you can't feel it. This is something by faith. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Because God says so. How is forgiveness possible? The Pharisees said that about Jesus. How can he forgive sins? They thought it in their minds when they, Jesus said it to the paralytic that had been dropped through the roof. I forgive, your sins are forgiven you. How can he forgive sins? Only God can. They were right. Only God can forgive sins. Why? One, because only, because every sin is committed against God. Two, because only God can determine how much satisfaction has to be made for each and every sin, and when that satisfaction is made. Only God can determine that. And three, only God can forgive because only He can satisfy His own justice. Only God forgives because every sin is committed against Him. Only He can determine how much satisfaction has to be made, and only He can provide in his own son, the satisfaction. How does God forgive? The method of forgiveness is justification. The language here in question and answer 56 is he imputes. If you go to question and answer 60, he imputes and grants. Imputation is God taking all of these sins and he puts them on the record of Jesus Christ. And he takes all of Christ's good deeds and he puts them on our account. 
so that the judge, the tribunal of God, as he stands and sits as judge, he looks and this is what he sees. You're righteous. You did it all right. I don't see any sin. Remember the parable about Judgment Day? Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Because when I was sick, you came to me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. We remember sins. When did we do that? They're gone. You did it right. You're perfectly righteous. The second Adam from heaven totally and completely bore the curse and the punishment that's due to us in his life of perfect loving obedience, fulfilling every aspect of the law, every second of his life is what God gives to us. That's how he does it. Why? What's the reason he gives forgiveness? Isaiah 43, verse 25. For mine own sake. That's what he says. It's for my glory. Another way to say it is this. It is not because you have been good enough or done something that distinguished you from everybody else. It is not because you're so special, Jacob, that you're different from Esau. No, it's not works. Aha, there's our theology. There's our right words. Okay, now let's live it. It's not because I am so special or so different. There's certain people we like and there's other people in the body of Christ we don't like. And we make a distinction because these have nice works and those don't. No wonder we stand before God and start thinking wrongly. It has to be because I'm better. How can that be when my conscience is accusing me I've grossly transgressed all the commandments of God and kept none of them? There's the tension inside of us. Wait a minute, the answer is, it's not works. Good ones or bad ones. It's all grace. Merely, merely for the sake of Christ's satisfaction. The language of our question and answer 60. Without any merit of mine, only of mere grace. It's a matter of free grace on God's part. It's never, not even to the smallest degree, because we do something that makes us worthy. Grace puts us in Christ. Grace sends Jesus Christ to the cross. Grace applies salvation to us. And grace says that satisfaction is full. It is complete. It is eternally sure. You are saved to the uttermost. The fruit, third point, of God's work of forgiving us is that we may know not only the outside, but this pot out of which all these sins ooze. Everything that comes from inside, we may know, is forgiven. Pardon is given for all of our sins. Not just the ones I'm sorry for. Every single one of them. Everything that I've committed here against him and that forgiveness is complete. Now, God tells us this not so that we think, well, then I don't have to be sorry. He tells us this so that we will be shamed 
into greater sorrow. So that we will walk humbly. We often think God remembers. Our, our consciences aren't always clear and clean. So as soon as something happens to us that is uncomfortable or bad, we right away start, ooh. Now I'm in trouble. He remembers. No. No. That's why he words it this way. I will not remember your sins. Psalm 103. That beautiful part of that confession at the very end of Lord's Supper. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. This forgiveness is experienced. First of all, it is experienced in the way of the preaching of the word. Declaring, God forgives. This is what the gospel is. The good news of salvation is that God has sent His own Son to bear the punishment and to earn forgiveness, complete forgiveness. That's the proclamation of the gospel. Second part of the proclamation of the gospel is not only the general knowledge proclaimed, the truth, but then when one stands and says, I repent, I am sorry, I acknowledge, I confess, then that word is brought very specifically not just generally, but very specifically, and it said, your sins are forgiven you. Gone. We, we sort of get it mixed up. When there's an announcement, it's never an announcement about sin. It's an announcement that there is forgiveness. Yes, there are announcements that the church makes when they're exercising discipline. First one is there's a sin involved in the congregation and there's unrepentance. Please pray. Then there's a name given and the, please pray. But most of the time when we have announcements, we, we think, well, some, we're informed about a sin. No, we're not informed. We're informed that there is forgiveness. Now, so often that can take place quietly and directly in the consistory room or in our, in our the pastor's off study or, or in your daily life, we forgive and we say that. Gone. Forgiven. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Forgiveness is proclaimed specifically to those who repent. So what did Peter say to those who were pricked in their hearts? For the promise is to you and to your seed, and to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Second, forgiveness is experienced, one, through the proclamation of the gospel. Two, it is experienced in the way of the child of God living repentantly. Not doesn't sin anymore, but he lives repentantly. He always is confessing, he's always acknowledging, and he is hating and doing his best to flee from. He fights. When one receives the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior from the punishment of sin, then he not only receives Jesus as the Savior from the punishment of sin, he also receives Jesus as the Savior who delivers me from the power of sin so that I can fight sin. I can acknowledge it. I can say I'm sorry. I can run from it. When we willingly and deliberately sin, then 
we are not going to experience pardon. We'll not taste forgiveness. So, too, forgiveness is experienced in the way of and to the degree of our living repentantly. Three. We're going to be a little bit more specific about two. And it's because of the connection that the Apostles' Creed does. And when they divided the the Apostles' Creed up, they put this one as a part of the Lord's Day that said, I believe in the communion of saints. And because it's connected by Jesus in that fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The experience of forgiveness... Our experience of what it is to have been forgiven is to be the driving force behind a spirit that forgives and forgives and forgives and forgives and forgives forgives, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven me. As God, for Christ's sake, hath, because I'm sorry. No, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven me. So we forgive and forgive and forgive. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray as part of the Sermon on the Mount. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We all know Matthew 18. Got to go to the brother. This is how Matthew 18 ends. The Lord came to the unmerciful servant and he said, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also to you if ye... From your hearts, forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So the experience of forgiveness comes in fleeing from the sin of not forgiving. Say that again. The experience of forgiveness comes when we flee from the sin of not forgiving. Our forgiveness is unconditional. The spirit of forgiveness is to be unconditional. When we put conditions on our forgiving someone, Do we expect him to put them on us? God forbid. The Lord's Supper form says it beautifully. You and I may be assured that no sin in us that remains in us against our will can ever be held against us or condemn us. May the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins lead always and constantly to the activity of fleeing from them, hating them, being sorry for them. Then, no sin that remains in us against our will can never condemn us.
thank him that he forgives all. That he forgives. Thank him again that he forgives all. Amen. Our Father, we can never thank thee enough in just one short prayer. It will take an eternity of delightfully thanking thee for the forgiveness that is ours, given to us merely for the sake of Christ's satisfaction. We love thee, too. For Jesus' sake, amen.